And uh, so I'm very happy Richard is back, Buddha and the Yogis, and John is here. And I'm um, delighted to see all of you. I can't believe all the happy faces. You're already happy, like. You don't even need to learn anything. <laughs> you look really, look at them, they're all the, smiling. The shining faces. They're just there. totally happy. It's really nice. It's really good. And, uh, you know, um, we are going to have a dialogue now, but first, since you're just here, how many of you are here previously to Buddha the Yogis? How many of you are repeat offenders? <laughs> well, not so many. Okay. Not so many. But quite a few, maybe 20-15%. And uh, then the others don't know that Menla means Medicine Buddha in Tibetan. It, uh, Sanskrit is Bhaisadya Guru, and the teacher of medicine, medicine or Medicine Buddha. And um, this mandala, this is Medicine Buddha, uh, and there's a whole story connected with it, which I won't launch into at length, but it's, um, there are eight Medicine Buddhas, and one of them is the Shakyamuni, same as the Shakyamuni Buddha, who 2,500 years ago, who is the Buddha of our era and of this planet, still. And he turned blue when he te taught the medical teaching. By thinking about the sicknesses and sufferings of beings, he turned blue. <laughs> but he, this blue was a radiant blue light that anything that light touched was healed. Anyone or any animal or human who were touched by that light or that blue light were healed by that blue light. So it's a very good blue light. It is said to be actually the light of ultimate reality, perfection, wisdom, which indicates somehow that, you know, in this basic underlying structure, energy structure of the universe or something like that, there is abundant energy of healing if people are not blocked from connecting to it through their ignorance, by their ignorance. But they connect to it through their wisdom, um, openness to it. And so that's why he turned blue. And then he created a thing. And so we have a sort of um, home, home, med a home meditation that we do that everyone does when we come here, when we do a spiritual program of our own. And that's what we're going to do now for a minute. That's okay. We will, we will enter the mandala mentally of the Medicine Buddha. If you would kindly go into meditative mode, you all are totally ready to do so at the drop of a hat. So it's hardly a worry. And uh, you know, however you visualize or imagine sitting in meditative mode, John and Richard will not run around and correct your posture. Don't worry. Not yet. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So, so now, now the, what you do, what we do is you calm yourself down. And uh, if we're doing this at length, which we're not tonight, just, just introducing the idea to create the environment of the whole week. And uh, because this is the Medicine Buddha environment. And um, so just first calm down. Then, and you know, usually we count to 10 or breaths or something like that to slow down the wandering mind, but you all look pretty concentrated. So what you then do is you turn your attention back into yourself. And as if you're looking into your own face and into your own brain, your own body, your whole heart and back and whatever, however much of a body scan you want to do, looking for your real self, and of course failing to land on anything solid, and when that happens you feel a little disoriented, which is good. So you let that disorientation give you a little bit of a melting feeling and don't feel threatened by it, that you haven't come up with some sort of flag-waving identity right away. If you do, you're making a mistake. <laughs> and uh, so then, as we say in the, in, in the Buddha Dharma, let it all become emptiness. Which just means freedom from intrinsically really being any sort of form of anything that is non-illusory. So you sort of open up your mind to what actually you are, and you realize you're not quite sure, and what the world is around you, there, therefore you're not quite sure. So then, but 
you don't just think of it as a nothingness or just an empty space. We just are open to whatever it might be. And when you do that then, out of that pure potential that is emptiness, freedom, you imagine a giant jewel palace rising all around, not necessarily the building that you walked into, which has dissolved. Instead, a giant jewel palace, in the center of which sits the medicine Buddha, with a sort of body of pure light, like a jewel, like, like a luminous sapphire or translucent sort of piece of lapis, bright lapis, smiling at whatever size you want the mansion and him to be, the medicine Buddha. And it's a vast building, and in the building there's Ganesha, there's Brahma, there's Shiva, Vishnu, Skanda, whoever else you want, and Bhavani. Uma, of course, is there to make Shiva behave. And also many celestial bodhisattvas, Avalokiteshvara, Anjushri, Akasha Garma, like many, so many Maitreya. And then there are Rishi sages, long haired, wild Himalayan sages, Hindu sages. And there are mendicant monks and nuns, Buddhist monks and nuns, the four main assemblies who are there to listen to the teaching of the Medicine Buddha on healing. And then around uh, the walls of this giant palace are transparent. And it is luminous jewels. It's like jewels that are sort of like neon jewels. They're transparent, but they also glow with light. So you're just flooded in any kind of light, rainbows of light. And whatever your nature is, if you're a little bit on the cool side of nature, the reddish and yellowish lights are dominant and they are warming you. If you are hottish, then the cool blues and greens and purples are cooling you. And you're just suffused with light. And you yourself are not your habitual, slightly weary embodiment. You are whatever you most need to be, to be balanced and concentrated. And in a way, your, your body, can, you, you can imagine your body being pure light, with certain sensitive channels within it, and, and lotuses and chakras and things, depending on what you know about that. However you like. But basically, you're made of light. And then outside the building, in the nature, Everything that grows, every plant, every tree, every bush, every weed, every tick even, every deer, every bear, every dog, they're all healing energies, they're also all made of light. And they're growing there to balance anything negative, anything in your body or mind, a feeling of discomfort or unease, so that you just feel buoyed and alert and energized and ready to open to learn whatever you put your mind to, to experience whatever you focus on. And this is the vision of Menla, of this hidden valley, what the Tibetans call the Beyul, a secret hidden valley, like a Shangri-La valley. Actually, the concept of Shangri-La was based on that kind of idea. On earth, but in a specially protected, special healing place, with everything in your vision and in your imagination totally positive, and the opposite of what you might expect, of sort of some sort of suffering and so forth, that's only just a mistaken perception, any kind of carried over 
addiction or suffering or depression or whatever it may be. So that as long as you're at Menla, you have this open field and then you and then don't worry if you can't hold this visualization in your mind of this jewel mansion, jewel palace. Once you start to meditate by creating that setting for yourself and creating that sort of ideal embodiment for yourself, then you just sort of know it's there and it buoys you up. And you can leave it open the entire next six days, if you wish. Or each time you finish the meditation, you can sort of let everything melt back into you and then be your ordinary self in an ordinary place, as, as you prefer. Then again, when you meditate, open it up again. This is a special type of Indo-Tibetan creation of a positive setting, like your own mental temple or shrine setting when you meditate so that you don't just bring your ordinary habitual process into the meditation, you shift that to be open to new insight and experience and learning. Okay, ding. Thank you. That's that's our medicine Buddha environment. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> okay. Why? Now I'll turn it over to you guys. Look, to quick, to yes, Sean. Can you explain why there are eight? Oh uh, yes. Um, there were seven brothers in a universe maybe two billion big bangs and big crunches ago. Because the universe in the Indian cosmology is beginningless. There's no like worry about the first creation. How did it first happen? Why did God make it like this? And sort of whole monotheistic thing. Let's not worry about that. It, it never made it, actually. It doesn't exist, if you're really wise. It, it's just pure bliss. But if you want to think of it, it's a beginningless, infinite bunch of big bangs. So thousands and billions of Big Bangs ago, there were these seven brothers. And they were sons of a king, and then they somehow practiced, and they all became enlightened, and they became medicine Buddhas. The way they configured their Buddhahood, their vow as a Bodhisattva, is that when I'm a Buddha, I want to have a body that will radiate a healing light, and anything in my awareness and in my field, anyone who looks at me or anyone who thinks of me will feel healed right away. Otherwise, I don't want to be a Buddha. They make, they make like a vow like that, like a Bodhisattva vow. And these seven brothers did that. And then they've been extending their healing energy all over the universe. And then they looked forward in time, because in enlightened being, time, time is not a solid flow. And every moment of past, present, and future is equally available to the consciousness of an enlightened being, which is infinite in time as well as in space. And uh, they looked way forward and they found our universe, and our galaxy and our little dinky planet. Actually, although apparently Jackie Muni Buddha operated on a number of planets according to the Mahayana. But anyway, they saw this one and they said, oh, that Shaky Muni Buddha is a macho guy. Because he's going to go to the planet when living beings are in a dark age, Kali Yuga, when living beings are really lowly in their expectations. They don't really hope, expect a lot out of life. They just resign to like whatever. They only live maximum about a hundred years. And they get sick all the time. And you're like freaking out about germs and bugs and whatever. <laughs> and so they're not going to be able to study Shakyamuni Buddha's teaching very well because they'll be sick all the time. And so what we're going to do is we're going to go to that universe in that billions of billions of aeons and universes in the future, and we're going to merge with Shakyamuni Buddha, and we're going to like introduce the medicine Buddha teaching, so that they can heal them, so they can be healed enough to study and do their yoga practice. Otherwise, Shakyamuni Buddha's, in, you know, like an avatar of being a Buddha will be for a waste, you know. So there's seven of them up behind them, Shakyamuni there, you see. <laughs> 